Hello everybody, welcome to A British Audio File. For those of you who don't know me already, my name is Taron. A little while ago, I asked a company here in the UK called Designer Cable to send me out some pro audio interconnects. You know, the type that you find in studios all around the world. And the reason is that when I'm generally asked by people who are getting into this hobby as to what interconnects or speaker cables they should go for, I always recommend going for a decent pro audio cable. So I've got three of those cables here, as well as two of my audiophile brands. And I want to answer two fundamental questions. Can I hear a difference between these interconnects? And if I can, is it worth paying the many multiples more for the audiophile brands? I have to declare right from the beginning, I don't have a horse in this race. I couldn't care less whether the cheaper pro audio cables sound better than the audiophile cables or vice versa. In fact, if anything, if the cheaper ones sound better I'll probably have a little bit of a smug smile on my face at the end of this video. So let's get started and have a look at what I have here. First up is the Van Dam XKE Star Quad that retails for £45 for a stereo pair on the Designer Cable website. For just over £50 you can get the Belden 8402 and for a similar price you can get the Mogami Negflex 2534. My Van der Hull, the first, will set you back the best part of £200. And if you're feeling flush for the best part of £800, you can get the Cord Company Signature. I did a video on cables when I started this channel over a year ago, so I'm not going to go over that all again. But I think it is important to summarise the key characteristics of a cable so you know what to look out for. And by far the most important characteristic is DC resistance. All three of these pro audio cables have very low DC resistance, below 100 ohms for a kilometer. That's a kilometer, not a meter. And audiophile brands don't generally publish full specs, which is shocking really, and just adds to this speculation of snake oil. But as far as my crude measurement device, my multimeter could tell, there was no discernible resistance from the cord company signature cable. So it's below obviously 0.1 of an ohm for a meter, so it's likely to be in line with these. But there was quite a significant resistance on the Van der Hull, that measured around 23 to 25 ohms, which is quite high really. The main factors that affect the DC resistance, other than poor quality termination, is the type of conductor and the thickness of that conductor. Now I don't know the thickness of these conductors because they're not specified, but all three of these pro audio cables have a thickness between 25 gauge and 20 gauge. Remember as the number goes down, the thickness actually increases. And all three of these are also pure copper construction with the exception of the Van Dam that has a few silver plated strands in there. Silver has a slightly better conductivity than copper. The Van der Hull, the first is quite unusual because that's actually a carbon conductor and that might be the reason why the resistance is higher. And the Cord Company Signature has strands which are all silver plated. If you're looking at copper cables, there are differences in the grade of copper that can be used. Now all of the cables here, with the exception of the Van der Hull, the first which uses carbon, are oxygen free copper. That's fairly ubiquitous. It has an impurity level of about two to 300 parts per million. And the next grade of copper that you may want to look out for is linear crystal oxygen free copper. That's a process that was patented by Hitachi in the 1970s and it involved annealing, which is reheating the copper after it's extruded. It drops the impurity level down to about 20 or 30 parts per million. And the highest grade of copper is OCC, Ono Continuous Cast Copper. And that has one continuous crystal boundary, which basically means that there's no impurities at all. Now this is where objectivists will be jumping up and down and claiming snake oil because there's nothing to suggest that if you go beyond the oxygen free copper that it makes any difference, it certainly doesn't show up in the measured performance. A decent interconnect should have vanishingly low levels of capacitance and inductance. If you have too much of it, it will cause high frequency roll off. All three of these pro audio cables have very low capacitance and inductance. I can't confirm it for the Van der Hull and the Cord because they don't publish their specs. And you should think of capacitance and inductance as forms of stored energy within the cable that you don't want. Capacitance being stored energy within the electrical field and inductance being stored energy with the associated magnetic field. You can't have one without the other. There are three factors that affect the actual amount of capacitance and inductance you have within a cable. The insulator that wraps around the conductor is known as the dielectric. Its job is to separate out the charges 
and it affects the speed at which the signal passes down the cable itself, something known as the velocity of propagation, which is expressed as a percentage of the speed of light. The ideal dielectric would be a vacuum, which has a dielectric constant of 1 and a velocity of propagation of close to 100%. Air comes fairly close as well, but neither of those are practical. If you're looking at cheap cables, you tend to find PVC used as a dielectric. That has a dielectric constant of 5 and a velocity of propagation of around 50%. The three pro audio cables here use the next grade that's commonly found, which is polyethylene PE. And the cord signature uses the next grade up that's commonly found, which is PTFE, also referred to as Teflon. That has a dielectric constant of around 2 and a velocity of propagation of around 70%. There are aerated versions of that where they try and inject a little bit more air into the density of the PTFE and they can get dielectric constants down to about 1.4 and a velocity of propagation of around 80%. I couldn't confirm what um, dielectric was used in the van der Hull. Again, there's nothing to suggest that these fancy dielectrics produce results that are audible when it comes to the measured performance of a cable. The geometry of the cable has an effect on the capacitance and the inductance of the cable as well. That's how many conductors you have, how they're spaced apart and how they're arranged. The Van Dam and the Mogami both have a star quad configuration, which is actually quite beneficial if you're using a balanced interconnect because of its noise rejection properties. The Van der Haal is a coaxial cable design. The Belden and the cord signature use two conductor pairs. The third thing that's worth mentioning here is whether the cables are shielded or not. Shielding is generally considered beneficial when it comes to interconnects because it can reduce the amount of RF and EMI external noise that's picked up by the cable, although that can be debated to some extent. In any case, shielding also does add capacitance and that shouldn't really be an issue over the cable lengths that we're talking about here. All the cables here are shielded with the exception of the Van der Haal the first. This is an earlier version of the cable that was unshielded. Terminations at the end of your cables are also important. You want good quality connectors with enough contact pressure. If there isn't, then your DC resistance goes up. Also, if they're soldered, as are these pro audio cables, you want that connection to be done properly as well. Otherwise, that's an opportunity to induce noise. All of these pro audio cables came already terminated with switchcraft connectors, which are good quality and audio grade solder. But if you want to do it yourself, you can save yourself about £20 and buy the individual parts from Designer Cable. The Van der Holder First and the Cord Company Signature are solderless terminations because they believe why introduce another metal in the signal path if you don't have to. For those objectivists out there, there was a blind test performed during this evaluation. I didn't do it myself for reasons I'll explain in a moment but I was able to get my wife to sit down for about an hour and a half and I played one track repeatedly, Flamenco Sketches by Miles Davis, it's one of her favourites. I just basically got her to listen to that track for 15-20 minutes and then I switched the cables. Sometimes I'd pretend to switch the cables and I didn't actually switch them. I made sure that I wasn't in eye shot and I just asked her to tell me which cable she preferred and whether she noticed a change. Every time, without fail, she noticed a change and she picked out the cable out of the two that she preferred. So take from that what you like. Unfortunately, I couldn't get her to do the same for me for two reasons. She's very loving and very supportive. I can barely get her to pick up the right remote control for the TV, leave alone get her to switch cables at the back of my amplifier. And the other reason was that I repeated these tests over two weeks again and again so that I could have some kind of reliability as to what was going on and there wasn't someone here that I could rely on to do that. If you're going to evaluate cable where the differences can be quite subtle, I have some advice for you. In fact, it's generally good advice if you're evaluating any hi-fi gear. Don't try and evaluate five cables like I did at the same time. I'm not doing this again. It took forever. Just pick out two cables. And also avoid the temptation to do quick A-B switching. That's where you listen to a cable for three or four minutes and then switch over to the other. Our short-term auditory memory isn't reliable enough. It's a bit like buying houses. The first time you go and visit, you notice general stuff. The second time you go and visit, you notice much more specific stuff. And that's how it works when we're listening as well. First time you'll hear that track, you'll hear the general stuff. And even if you change nothing, the second time you play the same track, you'll hear more. 
So listen for at least 15, 20 minutes before you switch and pick demo material that you know well, that is well recorded. You don't want to learn what's on the track. You need to know what's on there instinctively and pick tracks that basically demo different aspects of the music. So pick something for good bass extension or good top end extension or good male vocals or good female vocals. You get the general picture. Repeat the test over a number of days because there's a lot of factors that affect how we hear things, including our mood, how tired we are, how much background lighting there is, how much background noise there is. Believe it or not, how much electrical noise there is coming through the mains as well can have an effect. So you need to repeat over a number of days so you can get some reliable results. Just before I start looking at the evaluation results, let's talk about the system that I used to perform the test itself, most of which I happen to own myself, but not all of it. My Aurelic Aries Mini Streamer that's powered by an external MCIU linear power supply. That was then fed into the Denifruits Pontus DAC that recently came in for a review. And that in turn was fed into my Exposure 21 Pre and 18 Super Mono Blocks. That's still the most resolving amplifier that I've come across since I started reviewing on this channel. They then fed my Proact Response 1 SE speakers, which are also very resolving, supplemented by my RHEL Strata 3 subwoofer. Enough chit chat, time to look at the results. I evaluated the cables in 14 different categories, the kind of stuff that audio files typically tend to consider, certainly the kind of stuff that I tend to consider. And I scored the cables in each category from one to five, one being abysmal, five being excellent. So the maximum score that any cable could get was 70. So let me share with you my results. I've got them here on a notepad and I'll post something up on the screen so that you can actually have a look at what I'm looking at down here. So let's get started. Let's start with sound stage. The Van Damme had the narrowest sound stage. It was pretty much between the speakers. The Van der Haal and the Mogami extended it a little bit more left and right. And the Cord and the Belden were the only two cables that gave you a bit of sound stage depth. All the cables had reasonable imaging. You could make out where the instruments were located, but there was a touch of vagary, except for the Mogami, which was a little bit more rock solid. The Van der Haal had the woolliest bass, the Cord and the Belden fared quite a bit better, but it was really the Magami and the Van Dam where you could follow phonetic bass rhythms. Bass speed sometimes comes at the expense of bass weight, and that was the case here with the Magami and the Van Dam. The Cord and the Belden have a bit more oomph, but it was the Van der Haal that hit the hardest. In terms of bass extension, I couldn't tell the cables apart, so I gave them a three across the board. A lot of audio files look for that warm, rich sound, which primarily comes from the lower mid-range, and that's what the Beldum and the Van der Hull have. The Mogami and Van Dam sit on the leaner side with a chord somewhere in the middle. If you crave a little bit of excitement, it's usually the upper mid-range that's responsible between 1,000 and 5,000 hertz. All the cables did well here, but it's the chord, the Mogami and the Van Dam that had a little bit more presence. That area can also be responsible for a bright and harsh sound if gone unchecked, and the Mogami and Van Dam fell down a bit here. They are a little bit bright sounding. The ability to pick out leading edges of notes probably differentiated the cables more than anything else. The Van der Haal fell down a little bit here, the Belden less so. The Cord and the Van Dam did a very good job. The leading edges of notes on the Mogami were crystal clear. The Van Dam had the thinnest sound in the mid-range. This is also referred to sometimes as the body and the release of a note. The Mogami fared a little bit better, but not much and it was the Van der Haal, the Cord, and the Belden that gave you the most tonal richness. Many audiophiles love to hear the decay of instruments. The Van der Haal and the Belden suffer in this area. They're full sounding cables, but lack a little bit of clarity in this regard. The Van Dam does a little bit better. It's really the Magami and the Cord that give you a black enough background for those decays to really shine through. If you're looking for that airy quality on top, you'll be happy with the Magami and the Van Dam. The Cord and the Beldum in comparison are a little bit more recessed, but it's the Van der Hull that rolls things off the most. There's no point having that high end extension if sibilance isn't well controlled, otherwise that tss, tss, tss quality can get quite annoying. The most rolled off cables here have less to do, so they fare fairly well, but the Magami and the Van Dam do a reasonable job. If tonal accuracy matters to you, it certainly matters to me because I listen to a lot of acoustic instruments. The Van der Hull is the most warm sounding cable and colours the sound the most on that side of the spectrum. That's why it gets a two. The Beldum's still warm, but less so. And the Cord is the most neutral sounding cable and that's why it gets a four. The Magami in comparison is distinctly leaner. 
but it's the Van Dam that colours the sound the most on the other side of the spectrum, and that's why that gets a 2. For those of you who are interested in the results from my subjective listening tests, the Van Dam came in last place. In fourth place was the Van der Hull with 42 points. There was joint second place for the Mogami and the Beldum, even though they have very different sound characteristics. And the chord signature came out on top with 50 points. I didn't know what to expect, but there's some interesting results here. These cables do not sound the same, and for reasons I can't explain. I don't think an adequate explanation exists. When it comes to the science, I take a slightly philosophical approach. Our auditory system and the neurology of our brain have developed over eons. There might be all kinds of subtle windows and doors to our perception that we haven't uncovered yet. That seems quite likely. We know a lot about our auditory system. There's an awful lot that we don't know as well. And I'm not alone. Industry insiders, designers will regularly tell you that they switch out components and they measure the same but sound different. There either is a massive conspiracy going on or they're all incompetent. And then there's the electron itself, the fundamental particle that's responsible for all of this. We think of it as a tiny subatomic particle with a negative charge because that's how it's generally observed, apart from when it isn't. When you get into the realm of quantum mechanics, it's described as a wave because it exhibits the behaviour of a wave, something called wave-particle duality, which sits at the heart of quantum mechanics. And if you think that's science voodoo, well, that's the reason why you're sitting here being able to observe me now. A lot of our technology is based on our understanding of quantum mechanics. So if we don't know the actual nature of an electron itself, I think it's a little bit arrogant to assume that we've got everything figured out. My advice to those of you getting started in this hobby remains the same. Don't go and spend a whole load of money on audiophile cables when there's decent pro audio cables like this that exist. You've got to think of cables like a filter on your system, and spending more money doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to prefer the sound. You might not like the filtering effect that that cable is having on your system. For those of you who've got bright sounding systems that you want to tone down a little bit, I'd go for something like this Belden 8402. And for those of you who have dull sounding systems that you want to liven up a bit, well that's when you'd opt for something like this Mogami Negflex 2534. Audio files out there that have got highly resolving systems that are chasing the last bit of performance, don't worry about what the naysayers say. By all means, you should be investigating the audio file cable brands. Well, that's it from me for today. All that remains for me to say is if you like this video, please hit that like button, please share it. If you like what I'm doing with this channel and you haven't subscribed already, please consider subscribing. And don't forget to check me out on Patreon, where I offer some Patreon-only videos and some consultancy services. But for today, for now, a British audio file, Signing off.